In Parshat Pinchas, the Torah tells us as follows. Chapter 26, Sukim 20, uh, 52 to 57. By the Moshe Lemo, God talked to Moses saying, to this shall the land be divided as an inheritance according to the number of names and is a specific for every family and then ends up by saying goral. remember this word goral according to the lot shall one inheritance divided between the, the numerous and the few so the subject I would like to share with you today it's the subject of goral what does that mean, Goral? In the numerous occasions in the Tanakh and Jewish history, it was a use of Goral. Goral examples. When they divided the land, it was a different tribes, different families, and they have to make a determination who is going to get what. Later, the story of Joshua, soon we're going to discuss how he, he did it. You know many, many stories in the Tanakh, the story of Yonah, Jonah, we read in Yom Kippur, Ilarui, and much more. So the question is, how and what, when is permissible, when is forbidden, when can we use Goral, and remember, I'm going to use the word Goral, which means Ilarui or Lat, because that's the proper Hebrew word, but it meant, when I use the word Goral, it meant casting a lot, collecting numbers, and picking a number, and that number is the chosen number for uh, whatever needed. So it's a small example, when I was in service, so you know I served many years in the IDF, so we all want to go back uh, home for Shabbat, for weekend, but there are some people who need to do all kind of work, so it, always the officers used to collect a goral, collect all the names, call someone from the kitchen or one of those uh, youngest uh, people and pick up some names and those people who usually are people who stay over a weekend is that okay or not? in the uh, football, soccer, in the chess they do that all the times, they pick whoever is the last people and they pick between the few who is going to be the winner so this is the issue of Goran seriously speaking I would like to begin with a uh, true story that happened right before the beginning of the state of Israel it was a great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Arya Levin there are several books that written uh, about this righteous man and among many things he did he was the rabbi of the Etzel Etzel was the one of the organization pre-IDF and um, it was a crisis that 35 soldiers were basically get killed and it was a big issue of Hebra Kadisha of the sacred society, they want to recognize who and what. And they really have a hard time to determine who and how. Because uh, many times um, family members uh, want to have the clarity that that's really my loved ones in order for them to visit the grave and do other things uh, that involve with the cemetery. And in a situation like that, when you have an unidentified body, it's a serious crisis. Um, I remember one incident during the first Lebanon war, when it was a crash of a plane, and it was a huge ashes that came out. And the mother, one of the mother came to the chaplain and she asked him, when they build the monument, she said, which side is my son? So it's, it's a very serious issue, it's a very sensitive issue when it's come to a situation like that. So at that time, Rabbi Ar Levin did something that I uh, encourage you to read. It's called Goral Agra. Agra, it was the Rabbi Eliyahu of Vilna, Vilna Gaon, that uh, he formulated something which we need to discuss. It's like asking the Torah and getting the answer from the Torah. And it's a certain code, it's a certain way they did it, and according to what the Israeli history and the, and the story goes, uh, he made the Goral Agra, he knew the formulation, he made the Goral Agra, and they really, by that, identified, you can call it even miraculously, but identified in a way that it was satisfactory to both the families and the officers, so they will be able to bury those people respectfully. Um, 
So Goral, or in the Akedi language, they call it Puru, uh, which is the uh, predetermined for decision. It's a very controversial and serious issue because we sometimes uh, have the intent to think that it's simple. You know, what's the big deal? When you're not sure about something, so just pick several names, pick something, and let's make it happen. Is that okay? Some example when it's come to um, playing in the uh, casino, or playing a card, or playing chess, or playing games, is that okay? Uh, when we want to search something in the past, is that okay to use lottery? When we want to determine what's going to happen in the future, soon we see some examples. When can we do that and how? What is the inheritance? And you have several children, and you don't know who belongs to who, what. Here is Halakha, here is Jewish law that wants to tell us how to determine and who belongs what. So with that in mind, um, we see a first source in this parasha. You see the Torah tells us that it was a commandment. God said, This way God instructed Moses that the land should be divided. And then he used the word, goral. by the goral, he divided the land. So it appears that the Chalukat Eretz Israel, the way that they divided the land of Israel, they made it by the Goral. The Talmud derived from that a lot of uh, questions, even question over monetary issues, but also question of um, partnerships between people, or partnership between Jew and non-Jew, or um, negotiation, or when it's come to life, uh, issues like the story of uh, Joshua and Achan, or if it's a boat in a state of crisis and they need to make some to cast a lottery, um, or a situation that happened during Shoah, during the Holocaust, when they ask the enemies ask to pick someone as a victim and they need to cast some type of goral in order to uh, determine. So, before we go uh, to the specific, uh, I I um, show with you some examples of how um, the rural is crucial because there are some situations we cannot make decisions without using some type of goral. The question is, when we say that this is a koach elion, this is like a God interfering with the, uh, our human decision, and when we say that it's just Call it in Hebrew, derech stamit. It's just the way that we want to search something and we want to um, find um, um, resolution. Um, before I go to the example, I'll, I'll start with the source that we just discussed in the Torah. The Torah said two times, ach begoral techalek haaretz, that the, the land should be divided by the goral. And then they said, Alpi Rov, according to the, the um, Goral, you make decisions. And the rabbis ask why the Torah needs to repeat that concept of Goral two times. And this is a very famous uh, Gemara in Tracted Baravatra I would like to share with you, word by word, from the Gemara. So they said as follows. It's a um, Baravatra Kuf Kaf Bet, 122a. <coughs> <coughs> the Torah tells us that by the Goral, by the lottery, uh, the land should be divided. And they said, Lishmot Matot Avotam in Chalu, according to the names of the tribes they're going to inherit it. Alpia Goral Techalek Nachalato, according to the Goral, they divided each part. Ben Rav Lameat, between the many and the few. So here you see the, the definition of the repetition of the text. In one place we said Ach Bagoral, the other place we said Alpia Goral, according to the Goral. So the sages derive from here an important uh, learning. Velo haaretz ela begoral. They divided the land by the Goral, by casting the ladder. Shene Emar, as it's written, Ach Bagoral. Then the brighter said, Velo nechelka ela beurim vetumim. It was at that time a high priest that carried 
the Urim Betumim, which is the, like the breastplate with the names of the tribes. And then, Shene'emar al Piagoral, which means something was blinking. It's a question how exactly it happened. Is the letters, is the name of tribes, but that's the way they do it. So, Hakeitzad, the Talmud asks, how really that took place. Here is the answer El Azar is the name of the priest, El Azar. Melubash Urim Betumim. He carried this uh, breastplate. Ve'Yoshua ve'Chol Yisrael omdim lefanav, and Joshua and the people of Israel stand before him. Ve'Kalfi shel Shvatim. He carry. He has like a box filled of the names of the twelve tribes. And Rashi right away said, Argaz is like a box. Shemunachim bo shnei masal ptakim that they have 12 names of the 12 tribes. Vekalfi shel tchumin, and is a separate box that have names of locations. Rashi said, Argaz shemunachim bo is a box that you have shnei masal ptakim. You have 12 notes that carry shel shnei masal chalakim shel Eretz Yisrael, the 12 parts of the land of Israel. So again, you have two boxes, one box carried the 12 names of the 12 tribe. Another box carried the name of those locations in the upcoming land they're going to conquer, the land of Israel. The high priest, Elazar, standing there while carrying the breastplate. Yoshua standing there at the front of that. And he said, Munachim lefanav v'haya Elazar kohen mechaven beruach hakodesh. So Elazar made a special prayer. He used a, like we call it, divine inspiration. Urim betumim. Ve'omer zvulun ole. So they pick up from the tribe of the, from the box of the tribe. And the tribe, for example, the zvulun, come out. Zvulun is the name of a tribe that involved with merchants, etc. And then he look at the Urim Betumim, at the breastplate, and he said, Tchum Ako Oleimo. Ako is the name of a city north of Haifa. This is a city of boating. In those days it was a, like in nowadays it's a big cities that have import export. And the uh, high priest said that Ako came out together with the name of that tribe. Taraf Bekalpisho Tchumim. And then something like, magic or miracle or whatever you call it, uh, they went to the second box, the box that contained the name, the location, and the name of Aken came again when they pick up the box. So here now you ask a simple question, why you need to do it two times? Either you depend on the to me, or you depend on the Gora. But here you have a situation that they do it in a two, in a double manner. They have the Goral and they have the Urim Betumim. What's the reason? So, they, right away the rabbis explain it to us. Here is a, again the tractate Baba Batra, 122. Rashbam. Rashbam is one of the um, important commentators right after Rashi's time. And he wrote uh, here a beautiful explanation. It's about 12th century. And he wrote as follows. Hagoralu zeshe kovea. The reason that we have this, um, all this um, process, it's basically Goral is the one, the lad is the one who makes the the final. Siba talurim betumim. What's the reason we have this um, concept of the high priest with the breastplate? Levatel arinunim to stop all this gossip. The people may say that it was all kind of. Somebody did something, it was a clandestine deal, it was something that wasn't kosher, it wasn't right. So it was, in our language, some type of confirmation to prove that it's okay. <speaking in Hebrew> to emphasize that everything is according to the word of the law. So he added and he said, <speaking in Hebrew> is like divine intervention to prove, <speaking> in <Hebrew> to prove that this goral is okay. So again, Rashbam explained to us a crucial concept, which is the Goral is the key, the Urim Betumim has to take place, but just as a confirmation part, not as the one in that case who made the, the, the way that we divided the land at that time. The Torah go further to tell us that it was a process 
they said in the parasha, for example, Ele Pkudei HaLevi LeMishpechotam. That's the way that the tribe of Levi divided toward their family, internal division. So you have a process here. One is the name of the tribe, and then you have many families involved in each tribe. You have to make another goal to determine within the families the, the, the way that you divided the land. So it's a, I'll just give you the abbreviation, the Talmud, what exactly took place. They call it in the Talmud Ilui, which means that within the family, it was another process of goal that they have to determine within the tribe who is going to get what. Obviously, not everyone's going to be happy. Imagine if someone gets the valley or, or hills, etc., vineyard. It's, it's a land, that land is a land, so it's involved with a different people get different things, so not everyone's going to like. So there is Ilui, there is an eternal process that took place with eternal goral again in order to determine. Now, why it's so applicable to our time? What's involved with this in conjunction to us? So, you may derive first the concept that when it's come to inheritance, when you have several children, for example, that inherited a land or property or anything related to which we call kalka, or metaltelin, metaltelin meaning you have sometimes that the person left a estate, not necessarily a land, but valuable things. And again, you have situations that not everyone get along with everyone. I think I told you that, unfortunately, one time when I was a rabbi in New Jersey, um, it was a funeral, and it was five sons, and the director before the service said to me, Rabbi, um, you have to go to each of the sons and they are in different rooms because they don't talk to each other. So it's, that's the way the world runs. Uh, we are part of what's happening. So when it's the situation like that, especially it's involved with assets, with, with the properties, with, with the um, estate, you have to use sometimes lottery, but how exactly you do it? There is a special, in the code, is a special section that is called Choshen Mishpat, that they have a section that's called Dinei Chalukat Nechassim Meshutafim, how you divided a joint property. Um, how they derive it? How did they derive this type of halachot? How did they learn it? So the first source I'd like to show with you is the tracted Yuma. Yuma is the tracted that dealing with the service during the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippurim. And in the tracted Yuma, page 22, the Talmud tells us that it was a double goral, double goral, two times they do a goral. What is that goral? The Torah tells us, and I'm quoting book of Vayikra, Leviticus, uh, chapter 16, they said, Venatam Aharon al shne asirim goralot. Aharon is, was the high priest, he took these two animals and he put, a, he cast a goral. Goralot is the plural of goral. He, he, he cast a lottery for these two, and we started doing the Yom Kippur. And they said, Goral Echad La Hashem, Goral Echad La Azazel, which means one animal is going to be, in our language, sacrificed for the Lord, and one is La Azazel. If you read in the Torah, it was the scapegoat. So here is the question how exactly they cast those two animals. They selected these two animals, and now they need to do it. How they did it at that time. So the Rashi explained it, and he said as follows: Hakohen Agadol Ma'amid Sa'ir Echad Le'Yamin Ve'Echad Le'Smol. The high priests have these two animals standing, one on the right, one on the left. Ve'noten Shtei Adav Bakalfi. They don't call anyone else. He himself, the high priest, he takes his two hands and put it in a kalfi. Kalfi is like the box that contain all these um, papers. Notel goral biyamin, he takes one in his right hands. Vechavero, and the second one, the second goral, be small, in his left. And then, venoten al shnei asirim, and he puts what, have, what he have in the right hand at the top of one animal, what he have in the second one at the second animal. The one that is for the Lord is going for the Lord. 
משתלח לעזאזל, and the second one that is a scapegoat is going to be a scapegoat. So that's the way they did it at that time. Now, the Talmud elaborates on that, and they said that's not the only process of goral they did at that time, the ancient biblical time, then the temple time. The, uh, the Talmud tells us that it was we call in Hebrew pais. Pais is like, now in Israel you have mif'ala pais, it's like the lottery company. What did they do? The Talmud said in Shabbat, Kuf Melchit, Tractate Shabbat 148, they said that even within the priesthood, when they have this mass of sacrificial offering, Chalukat korbanot la'achila, when they need to divide among the priests those offering after the process of um, um, all the sacrificial process, it was again alidei goral, they basically made a lottery within the priesthood, within the priest, to make sure that they divided it in a way that it's a goral, so you cannot complain, that's what's come out, that's your part. Because within the animals, within eatings, there are parts that people want, and there are parts that people you know, prefer that somebody else should have it. So, again, you see this pies takes place um, within, not only by the Kohen Gadol in the Yom Kippur, but also within the families. Uh, so here is the question we ask about dividing land. So, Choshen Mishpat, in Kuf Ayim Gimel, is a special chapter, 173, deal with the situation like that, such as dividing lands. Or the Rambam in Chot Shchenim, the Rambam deal again with the issue of neighbors. Soon you see what's involved with neighbors, and again in lottery. And it's a lot of um, issues that you need to use Goral in order to make, uh, to make a final decision. Those who want to uh, read more, the Talmud in, in this tract in Baba Batra, 106, have Kuvah, have a lot of um, explanation on that. So, what we see so far, what we understand just from this beginning of our talk, is, uh, you see that the Goral happened in a s several occasions as a process, and it was legitimate. But, again, you have to ask yourself, okay, I understand that it's ancient biblical time, but when exactly you say that this is God's decision, and when you say that it's our decision, when you say that, that when, when they pull the hands and they pick something, is the person's uh, just whatever you call it, by, by luck or by just make things happen, and when you say that it's like Urim Betumim, that is something like a confirmation from the Lord, that that's, uh, that's the right uh, uh, way. So, uh, King Solomon, in the book of Mishlei, the book of Proverbs, say a very sharp sentence. And again, we need to understand what he meant. He said, Bachek yutalet ha-goral, the goral, you just made it, ume Hashem kol mishpato, and then God reaffirmed it. God is like, give the stamp of confirmation to that. For what he's talking, he's talking about the event of Yehoshua, of Joshua and Achan. What exactly happened in Joshua and Achan? Uh, abbreviation to that terrible event. Um, what happened, Joshua was the leader after Moshe Rabbeinu, after Moses. And um, he followed God's instructions. He learned all the mistakes in the past. He sent specific spies and he instructed them how to do it. And they circled around Jericho seven times. You know the story, the, the, the wall fell, they, they, they blow the shofar, and they conquered the city of Jericho. That came with a very clear instruction. The instruction said, you're going to win this city, God said to Joshua, and it's going to be a miracle, because this group of slaves that, you know, that just entered the, the land, and they, they, what they do, they're circling around the city and blowing the shofar, and now all the walls just collapse, and people run away for their lives, so it's, it's a God's uh, involvement. However, God asked them to do what? Not to touch anything that left over from that city. And Joshua used a very strong statement. And um, if you read the beginning of Joshua, in particular chapter 14 and onward, Joshua instructed people not only um, not to touch anything, but he even used some type of curse 
to whoever dare to touch from the leftover of that city. They went ahead to the next city, the city of Ai. They just moved ahead in order to conquer the land. Unfortunately, at that time, soldiers been killed. 18 soldiers and Joshua realized that something is wrong because so far miracles occurred. They crossed the Jordan River, which is like almost Red Sea miracle. They conquered the city of Jericho, which is a mighty city with mighty kings. They conquered it. And now all of a sudden, over a relatively small city of Ai, he is losing soldiers. So the text tells us how Joshua fast, back to God, pray, put the ashes on him, and, and pray with all the leaders. Ask God for guidance. He wants to know what exactly happened and why things happened. By the way, you know that um, Aleinu Shabeach, the first part of Aleinu Shabeach, composed by Joshua as a thanksgiving to God for the city of Jericho. That's what we say at the end of the daily prayer. Well, since they is the middle of the war and they have no idea what's happening, God responded to him. And God said to him, someone is a traitor. Someone did not follow the instruction. So Joshua asked, he said, can anybody know anyone who did something like that, took from leftover and no one admitted? As a result, Joshua asked the Lord and eventually get the approval to cast a lottery. And the text tells us in a very clear way what happened and how it happened. The text tells us that they first they put a, a box filled of names of all the tribes. Is the, um, uh, you see the beginning of that incident in Joshua 7 and then further on the entire first part of Joshua. They took this big box <laughs> and they pick a name of a tribe and they pick the one of the tribe judah and then he called all the leaders head of families and no one um, admitted anything so he felt that um, he needs to know the objective truth and in another cast he pull in all the names of families and he gets name of families and in short within it was large families you get specifically to certain family, it's go to Zavdi, Karmi, etc. It's a specific names within the tribe until if you reach, narrow it in a level that you reach a specific um, small group of family and it's come out with a guy by the name of Achan. Ein Kaf Nun Sophie. So Joshua called Achan and he asked him, and he asked the family member what happened, and Achan admitted. And he said, yes, I took some silver, some gold, some leftover, and he took um, Joshua and the leaders, and he showed them exactly the place that things were buried, was taken by him, etc. Joshua had a very serious uh, predicament. It was a serious dilemma because uh, in one hand, he is admitting something by the same token, he is responsible for death of other people and it's a midst of war and, um, and needs to do something. So, in short, he asked God, etc. And the text tells us that he was stoned. Uh, but, before he was stoned, um, they tell us that he confesses. In a sense, in our language, he made a teshuva and he died as a good man, as a righteous man, because he confesses over that and he accepted the judgment. Part of his confession we said every day, and this is the second part the rabbis tell us of Aleinu Shabeach. When we use Aleinu Shabeach, the second paragraph, Al Ken Nekave Lecha, Al Ken Nekave is abbreviation of his name, Achan, Ein, Al, Kaf, Ken, Nekave, Nun, and that's the text according to our tradition that Achan delivered at the time of um, tremendous crisis before he was stoned, as again, act of teshuva, that everyone recognized that you are the Lord God, etc. So that's the paragraph to repeat three times a day, as the second paragraph from Achan. Back to our subject. 
that trait of casting lottery made um, some type of affirmation uh, to use in a certain time. Because again, you see here a great leader like Joshua, uh, he selected and he did it in a system, systematically way. He went to the tribe, had families, and other family now and now until he reached that point. Again, here we have to admit the way that we read the Tanakh, the sacred document, that is a God interfering here. Because number one, God told him that someone did something. Number two, God instructed him to do certain things. Number three, you see how it narrowed and how they caught him. So for sure you can say that in these incidences, like the first one, the way they divided the land and the Urim Betumim, and here, the way that Joshua found Achan, is incidences that you see the God interfering. Now, here is our question. Does that mean that God interfering in every event? Is God interfering in every time that the person uh, called 900 horoscope, you know, mm -hmm. in a paper and wants to know if tomorrow is a good day or bad day or should I invest in a certain companies? What exactly we say that God interfering or we even allow to search or not? Why use the word even allow? The Torah tells us in Parashat Shoftim, in the book of Deuteronomy, important sentence. The Torah said, Tamim tiyei Mashem Elokecha. You should be wholehearted with your Lord your God. So the Torah tells us in a very succinct, clear way that we are not supposed to go to any type of sorcery. And the Torah elaborates on that. Rashi right away said there that the person should not search what is a future. A person should not involve of going to Sister Faye on West Street and asking for ten dollars what's going to happen in my life. Okay, that's forbidden. Now, since the Torah forbade us, and it's a part of the commandment we're not allowed to, you may have said, ah, but this is a, like a contradictory to, to what we said earlier. What we said earlier. We said that the land of Israel divided by the Goral. We said that Joshua did it in the time of Achan. We said that in Yom Kippur, Shnesi Reizim, the two goats, was divided again by the Rari. So, when exactly you said that it's Nevu'ah, it's like type of prophecy, and when we say that it's, it's not. Um, I would like to show with you some more examples in the Tanakh to uh, um, brighten this discussion. The way that the first Jewish king was chosen, King Saul, in the book of Samuel, chapter, the first book of Samuel, uh, chapter 10, it tells us that King Saul was chosen by Goral. Um, you ask yourself, how, how they did it? So they said that it was a goral, they cast a goral, and his name came out, and that's the, the way they, they, they chose it. But again, you ask a question, the text tells us that Saul was the smartest man, he has a special trait, etc. Um, is that the way that they're selecting king just by goral? Further on, they said in chapter 14, in the first book of Shmuel, King Saul wants to know why they lost the war. And he caught by Goral that his son Jonathan betrayed him when he tasted the honey. Those of you who wants to read is the first Samuel chapter 14. So you see here that Saul did it. The rabbi says the way that he did it, Saul did it, he told the Urim Betumim. He asked the high priest. It wasn't really the Goral, but anyway, uh, he wants to know who tastes the the. the the food when they finish the war with the uh, Plishtim, with the Philistines. And, and uh, uh, Saul said to the Lord, Have tamim, which means, Rashi said, Ten goral emet, ten, tell me exactly how things happen. So, again, sometimes you see that it happens to the Urim Betumim, sometimes you see that he used the goral. You see um, that other nations, follow us in many occasions the Tanakh mentioned. For example, you see in the uh, Ezekiel that uh, in chapter 21, when he described the evil king Nebuchadnezzar, so he again, he uh, described how Nebuchadnezzar find a way to get to Jerusalem and to attack. 
and Ezekiel said that he used a certain term of goral. Um, famous text in the book of Esther, chapter 3, sentence 7, I assume you all know it. It's how Haman did, the text said, he peeled poor, who are goral, poor, poor him, which means he cast a lottery. Uh, Haman wants to know when is the best day to, uh, to just get rid of the Jewish people. So, uh, meaning that he believed that there's a certain date and certain time that it's good to do certain things. And the most famous story, we all said it on Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonement in the afternoon, the story of Jonah. Jonah the prophet went on a boat, unwanted mission. God told him he had to do it. He wants to, in our language, sitting in the yeshiva, not battle with the world, but God insisted. So he thought maybe if he leave, he get away from that. And that in the middle of the water, and all the sailors noticed that something is going on and something the, the whole water is like turmoil and and he was sleeping and they, they pray and they wake him up and they start casting lottery and eventually it came out on Jonah several times and Jonah insisted that he said yes I am the one throw me to the water they still try hard not to do it but eventually the text tells us how Jonah was basically out of the boat and the big Leviathan swallowing the rest is history. You know that story. But we can derive a lucky question, which is, in a case like that, when a person in a state of crisis, God forbid, if it's a, let's say it's a boat and it's all it's turmoil, and if it's okay to do something, can be two different scenarios. Can be a situation that the, everything is stormy, and then it's not just this boat; it's everywhere. Can be a situation that happens soon. You see in one of the responses when you have all the other boats at peace everywhere, and this particular boat has a turmoil, and not from the boat itself, by some something that happened with the water and the boat, and something there that it's specifically to that boat. Can we say that it's okay to cast a lottery? It's okay to do what they did to Jonah, or you say that these people are murderers for doing so. Um, there are many more examples, which I'm not going to impose on you, but basically there are many more examples in the Tanakh that are dealing with, uh, with the, the issue of lottery. So I would like to uh, zoom in and show with you some discussion in Halakha and how basically the rabbis um, derive important conclusion that so much apply to our times. First is the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah, Jonah said to them, Sauni vehatiluni el hayam. He asked them to go ahead and to cast him to the water. The great Rabbi Karelitz, the Chazon Ish, he wrote, and I just paraphrase his word in Hebrew, he said, Asur latet af echad neged retsono. You cannot, it's like committing a murder. You cannot throw someone out of the boat, and it can happen in many different instances. And even a situation that everyone agree, including that person himself. So basically, if a person himself agree and everyone agree, and then you make it another, another, it's another question. But if someone is disagree, like the person himself or anybody else, then for sure is no way to allow it. The big question, so how come Jonah happened? The responses, the traditional response of the rabbis are two, again, we short in time, i just give you the abbreviation. One response is because Jonah was a prophet, and he knew the formulation of Goal, and he instructed them how to do it. One way. Another way to say the opposite, <clears throat> that these people are drunk, that these people doesn't know what they're doing anyway. They sell a bunch of sailor, and they did whatever they do, but uh, even though you said that they try hard not to do it, the text said that they try hard. One of the great source that uh, I would like to show with you, it's a book called Sefer Hasidim. Sefer Hasidim <coughs> is a book that's written at the 10th century 
And the rabbis uh, hold that book not just one of the crucial book of halacha. There are some rabbis who hold that book as equivalent to Tanaic book, like the second, third century, which means they hold this specific book, specific rabbi, highest than anyone um, to this very day. So Sefer Hasidim says two statements that one contradicted the other, and we need to understand what he said and why. He said, in a situation, if it's a boat at the midst of tremendous turmoil. So he said, you're not allowed to cast the goral. Why? He called it asmachta. What is asmachta? Asmachta in general, when you have someone who's professionally gambler, we said that that gambler cannot be accepted as a witness in a court. Why? Because if he is making a living, instead of making a normal living by doing a normal transactions between two partners, like buying something, selling something, and doing exchange of, but he is focusing on the gambling, you cannot trust him when it's come to um, uh, witnessing in a court. It's called asmachta. His way of living, it's not the proper way. So in that sense, um, when it's come to asmachta, especially in the life situation, the nene fashot, if you're dealing here with a life or death situation, um, he call it asula rogal pigoral. You cannot kill a person. You cannot commit the murder by the goral. It's like a formulation of murder. However, in the same book, Tafresh Aintet, one of the chapter, he said the opposite. Bnei Adam shovrim bayam. If people are um, going with the boat, like one in, in Italy not long ago, ve'amdalem ruach sara. Latvia. And suddenly it was a tremendous storm that the boat is about to sink. And all the other boats go at peace. Nothing happened to them. Most probably someone in that boat is responsible for something. So he said they can go ahead and did what they did with Jonah, which means they can do go a lot three times and even to go ahead and cast him out of the boat. The rabbis ask, how come Sefer Hasidim contradicted himself? And I give it the abbreviation. The rabbis said that the first one is in a regular storm. Uh, the second one, everyone else, it's quiet and just this specific boat, which called the hand of the Lord. Something involved with God saying same, something like God sending a signal. So what we understand so far, we understand that um, when it's a situation that we don't know who is guilty, in order to determine the past, we cannot cast a ladder. In order to know what happened in the past, we cannot do. The story of Joshua and Achan and Urim Betumim or the story of Jonah, it's a biblical story that applied to specific instruction in a specific situation. We have to follow what we said, one of the commandments, Deuteronomy, Tamim Tiyeh, we have to be wholehearted with the Lord God, so we cannot cast lottery over past. Regarding to the future, the same story. It's not only horoscope, it's any type of stargazing, any type of searching something related to future, Tamim Tiyeh, we should be wholehearted with God. Again, we as a Jew, not allowed. However, when it's come to inheritance, when it's come to business, when it's come to a a conflict that before the court and the court needs to determine how to handle this type of situation, it's allowed 100% to cast a lottery, especially if both parties agree. But even is no agree, as long as it's involved with monetary issues or inherited issues, the court can use their authority to impose on them if it's a brothers, if it's inheritance, if it's estates, if it's a uh, conflict, monetary conflicts, they can impose on them um, um, core decision of casting a ladder. We asked a question earlier about Goral Agra. The question we asked earlier, and again, it's a lot to disguise, I'm giving you just abbreviation. Um, we asked a question of uh, um, casting a ladder, uh, casting a Goral Agra. Vilna Gaon, the great rabbi, 18th century, he formulated something and in that, uh, it basically gave a special formula how to uh, determine certain things. 
and you see in Jewish history that it was used. So the question is, when can we use it and how? You see a great Rabbi Aaron Levine that he did it. Uh, the answer, it's a uh, several sources. The first source is a book called Birkei Yosef, but it's not only him. I found that in other books, um, in the Chida, um, Rabbi Chaim David Azulai, the great Sephardic Rabbi, Yalkut Shimoni, and more. He said as follows, this is Yoweh the Ha, it's the code, uh, Kuf Ayin Tet, 179. Nireli, the Lekule Alma, Mutar Liftoach Batora. It's okay for everyone, he said, to open the Torah, and look, and pointing the Torah, the pasuk, the sentence that comes out of the Torah, because the Torah is our living Torah, it's our living life, and since we follow our lives by the way of the Torah, so therefore, Yerkei Yosef tells us that we can go ahead and open the Torah, look at the text in the Torah tells us, and we can follow that text in the Torah. It's not form of divination, it's not stargazing is not calling the horoscope etc that's the central of our lives proof to that again he goes by the Tanakh at the book of Kings uh, we study several years ago book of Kings is a story of a righteous king by the name of Yoshiahu and Yoshiahu get the sense that things going wrong and you realize that already the time that people passed the, the border of time of sinning and it was already signals from Babylon, the armed forces coming, etc. So at the time of a uh, great uh, stress, Yoshiyahu, the king, opened the Torah and he pointed the pasuk that came out of the Torah. And unfortunately, it's come of the series of the um, admonition. There's a section in the Torah that uh, filled of very strong words. And it come out with the word Yolech Hashem et Malkecha That the Lord will take you king out of your land It's like a series of curses So he was like out of himself when he read it And he went to the prophet and he asked And they told him yes, that's what they're predicting The, the Hulban, the destruction of Beit HaMikdash So Yoshia was the king He right away um, did a mass teshuva Which means he asked everybody to repent And people pray and repent Unfortunately, according to the text of Book of Kings, it was too late. And uh, the end is history. You just need to read the Book of Kings, how things turn. But, Birke Yosef said that Me'achar ve'natal itza me'atora He took, King Yoshiyahu, opened the Torah, and he saw the response from the Lord in the text of the Torah. He said, Ve'en ze bichlal mishtamesh b'atora You cannot say that he used the Torah for his own benefit or use the Torah for some some um, personal need that was need um, he said even in general we don't do go a lot we don't do this type of things in this type of situation it's okay so what we understand there are two different concepts one it's in the Torah time itself when you use a certain go a lot for certain situation and it was also a rimba to me or if a person used the Torah itself for needs that's not the Goral Agra to say it's just open the Pasuk and seeing what's, what's the, the answer for certain uh, situation Goral Agra, I'm not going there, I'm just giving you the abbreviation it's basically a special code to open the Tanakh and then use number 7 several times and pages number seven and lines seven lines and then seven words and then get the proper answer but again you need to be very erudite to do it uh, to do it properly and again for the purpose of doing it for the sake of embellishment the the community or, in, or something that relate to respond for the, from god so to wrap it up before go to your questions um, um, uh, what we understand that the whole concept of Goral is a broader concept and we cannot compare biblical stories to our times there are certain situations that we can use some example of the Torah but most of the situation it's in our language it's not applicable 
I mean by that. Searching the past, searching the future, forbidden. Asking the Torah, open the Chumash, and just pointing the Chumash, that's fine. And um, the only time we permit or even encourage, if it's the Bet Din, if it's a Jewish court case, that they feel, the Dayanim, the three judges feel that that's need. Example to that. Example to that, it's a, um, two examples. One is the Maharshal. There is a great rabbi by the name of Rabbi Shlomo Luya. In his book, Yam Shel Shlomo, he said, he lived in the 16th century. He said, it was a case that came before him of Yibum, which is, it was uh, three brothers. The first one married to a girl, and he passed away, unfortunately, with no children. And he have a, two brothers that are twin, right next to him. Meaning the king in the family is the, just the two brothers. And because they are twin, identical twin, the question is who is the obligation of Yibu? Who is the obligation to liberate the widows? As you know, the Torah asks us to do a special mitzvah in a case like that to perpetuate the name in the family by having the, the brother go ahead and marry the, the widows. But since he's the twin brothers, they asked this rabbi at the 16th century which one, and he determined it by Goran. So you see again, the determination, it's according to al in certain cases, in a certain situation. Another one, via negativa, the opposite way, the great rabbi Ovadia Yosef, the head of the Sephardi community, who wrote endless books, he brought an example of um, community in Israel that uh, wants to hire a rabbi for that community and they have like we call it in Knesset a big board big board of governors um, we always say that going to the Israeli Knesset and see what's happening the only good news is that it's like a big board of governors discussions you have a lot of opinions and you have a lot of um, people who carry a very strong feeling over either my way or no way so, in short, at that time, it was a board of governors that contained 36 members. And they asked Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, since it was absolute divided between 18 and 18, which means 18 board members wants one candidate, and 18 other board members want the other candidates. So, someone suggested that they should cast a lottery. And they cast a lottery, and one of them uh, won. So the one who lost uh, filed a paper to the Bet Din stating that it's not halakhically correct by using Goral to determine who is the winning candidate since it was split equally. And at that time, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef hold that um, basically that decision was, was uh, incorrect which means using lottery at that decision was not correct because um, that was basically need to re-examine entirely. The obvious reason everyone understands is just because it's not good to lead a community of fully splitting between two, but also the whole concept of using Goral, you see how sensitive it is, in, even in al when and where and how. So what we learn is a several important concept. One it's called the Pais, Pais the way that they did in the Beit HaMikdash, the, the two Korbanot. Another important concept is the whole Goral, the Uwin V'tumim, the breastplate that they use, biblical examples, and most contemporary responsa. And at this time, I encourage you to ask me questions. This is your time. Dave, you can push the button, and people can ask me questions.